Hey, this is Brent Jensen, and you are listening to No Sleep Till Sudbury, the show where we talk about the music that makes your skin vibrate. The show is brought to you by Pariah Pickups. What you want, what you need, what you love. Check them out at pariahpickups.com. And if you're looking for a realtor, look no further than my pal, Mr. Stephen Fleming. He's my personal realtor. I would not use anyone else ever. And now that the market is really starting to heat up, you might want to give him a call. You can find him at Fleming Properties. Com. All right, today I am joined in my home by a friend of the show, Mr. Tom Jokic, and he is here to talk about something called When Rock Stars Attack. I'm going to let him explain. All right, Tom Jokic, welcome back to my humble abode, my friend. How are you? I think this is Tom. I'm great. This I think this is the fourth time we've been together. It is. Yeah. It is. I've run out of songs that make my uh, <laughs> that, you know skin vibrate. They make my skin vibrate. Um, but I'm so happy to be back. And you've been on my show too. I have. Which is unusual because normally we have a vast archive. We dig into the archive, so we have very famous people. And Brent Jensen. <laughs> Thank you. So what it is, in case uh, your listeners are interested. I think it's our favorite stories, and I think it might be episode like 709 or something like that. But just look under favorite stories and uh, under the, on the, the, you know, famous Lost Words feed. But you tell the story of interviewing J.J. French for the very first time. Yes. And how you ended up doing it shirtless, but you didn't realize the camera was on. <laughs> and uh, it's such a funny story. And I, so we have like, on that episode, we have like uh, one of the guys from Tears for Fears telling his story about Ringo Starr. Yeah. And we have Randy Bachman telling a story about working with Ringo Starr. And we have other artists telling great stories. We have my co-host Christopher Ward talking about one of the funniest uh, Robert Plant stories you will ever hear. He told me that story. Yes, it's a great with story, right? Spago, yeah. yeah. And then and the and then we have on that episode we have you talking about interviewing <laughs> JJ French. And honest to God, it's one of the highlights for me. I loved it. Oh, thank you. I always love talking to you. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. No, likewise. I was just saying earlier that and you have guests in. It's it's a little bit different from having you in because it's like having a friend that that you just happen to be recording. Yeah. We always have nice chats. We were just golfing the other day. We were. Which is great. Well, yeah. great is a strong word for to, to describe us playing golf, especially me. <laughs> I wasn't talking about our skills. Yeah. <laughs> I was talking about the time. <laughs> right. We have a great time. We do. We do. We do. We have a lot of fun. So now today, yeah. you're here to talk about, and this is funny because on the golf course, you pitched me on this and I said, absolutely, we have to do it. Okay. When rock stars attack. Right. So the premise of Famous Lost Words is we have access to the entire 1050 Chum and 104.5 Chum FM interview archives from over the years. I worked there. I worked at Chum FM for 32 and a half years. So from 1986 to 2019. And so I was involved in either interviewing some people, like I interviewed Mick Jagger hmm. and a bunch of other people, you know, Don Henley, uh, Landis Morris at the Bee Gees, or I was part of an interview or I was producing the interview but also, there's all the interviews from before my time. So one of our guys, uh, uh, our classic uh, broadcasters, um, John Donaby, talking to John Lennon in 1974. Wow. So I have access to all of that, right? Mm -hmm. But we even have clips of like freaking Buddy Holly, and I don't even know how we got those. Wow. Right? Yeah. And some of them are just like Buddy Holly on talking to Alan Freed, so we know where we got that, right? But And, you know, Dick Clark talking to other famous people. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's our thing. So what I noticed is every once in a while, an artist will turn on another rock star. So we have this feature called When Rock Stars Attack. <laughs> and, and it's quite funny. We've done a few literal episodes because our shows are about 40 minutes long. Every once in a while, we'll do like 10 minutes of When Rock Stars Attack. And one of them will be like Karen Carpenter of the Carpenters complaining about Casey Kasem. Oh. Right? Complaining about him giving incorrect information on his American Top 40 show. Really? Right? And it's funny having Karen Carpenter, who's very charming, surprisingly charming. I, was, I would have thought that. Right. Yeah. Talking about Casey Kasem or when rock stars attack Karen Carpenter versus a housefly who happens to be sitting on her drum while she's drumming Top of the World and ready to smack that you know, ever-loving <laughs> you-know-what out of this common housefly. And it's funny, right? Yeah. Um, and we have, you know, heavy duty rock stars, but we also have like Helen Reddy talking, talking about punk rock. 
Oh, wow. And how she hates punk rock, she's more into punk M.O.R. because that's what she is, right? Right, right. <laughs> so, so that's the premise of When Rock Stars Attack. So, but what I did is I, I thought I'd bring five examples, really good examples of When Rock Stars Attack from our archives. So not too many people have access to the archives there, Brent, but now officially you do. Woo-hoo. And here are five clips. All right. Okay, so before we get into these now, uh, Famous Lost Words yes. is your podcast. Yes. I'm going to pump the tires for that one a little sure. bit because I love it. Mm-hmm. Uh, new season starts when? New season started a couple of weeks ago. Episode one was with Robert Plant, and it's excellent. And this is an this is an interview with our good friend Bill Walichka, who oh, I nice. believe you've yeah. interviewed. Have Bill's you not? Great. He's been on yeah. the show. Yeah. He's great. Love him. And he did a phenomenal interview. Uh, last year, we ran an interview of his with Prince from like 2004 or something like that. Mm-hmm. And this interview with Robert Plant is from 2005. Okay. And so uh, it's excellent. So we had Robert Plant. We had a story about how Prince became a superstar. And that is an interview with uh, the writer Alan Light, who wrote a book about how Purple Rain became big. So that's in that episode as well. Okay. And then, um, and we have B.B. King, an interview with B.B. King. Wow. From 1981 and John Donaby, uh, legendary broadcaster I just mentioned a few minutes ago. So so that's what you just missed, but you can hear it anytime. Mm-hmm. iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, anything like that. Perfect. Also, the show, which by the way, my co-host, just a little known guy named Christopher Ward. I've heard of The him. original Much Music VJ. <laughs> He's been on your show He's fantastic. He like one of the nicest guys ever. Mm-hmm. And we met and we were at a party. We met and I just said, Christopher, I don't know, but I kind of think you and I would make a good show together. And here's my concept. And he went, oh, I'm into that. No so, way. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I was talking to him. We were probably shooting the breeze at uh, at a backyard party at Roger Ashby's house. At Roger right. Ashby's guy I worked with on the morning show at Chump for all those years. And um, Christopher was there and I'd never met him. And I just went, after about five minutes talking to him, I said, Christopher, I have an idea. Let's have lunch. And then a few weeks later, we had lunch and he said, yeah, I'm really interested in that. And trust me when I say we do it for love of music. Yeah. We don't do it for money because for the most part, we get paid virtually nothing to do it. Mm -hmm. As you know, podcasting is not a lucrative business. Well, it's it's almost the opposite of lucrative, right? (laughs) So, so... And I'm I'm one of those people. I'm you know you have a little bit more. I think you're you have more confidence to sell a show and that mm. kind of thing. I have none of that. I am a geek, and I no, don't I don't want to go out and sell my show. I want to, but I I don't have that kind of that innate sales right. kind of person. But you have a promotional kind of bent to you sometimes. Yeah, you know it. It just it's interwoven with other things that yeah. I do, right? So I'll right. do um, like well, the books first of all, the three books. Right. This is an extension of my third book, really, because in right. the third book we talked about music and how it makes your skin vibrate and all that right. stuff, um, and then speaking gigs. So everything kind of like you know works together cross promotionally. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so Christopher and I, you know, we got together and we've been we've been doing this show. Uh, uh, for more than six years now. Mm, yeah, wow. we've got about 150 episodes. and That's great. Yeah, it's so fun. It keeps me busy. I love it. For I sure. Love the show. Yeah, highly recommended. Okay, now my friend, uh, When Rock Stars Attack. I have five audio clips here. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to go through them, and these are funny. I've heard them. Right. <laughs> these okay. are from the archives. Okay, let's do this one. Okay, so the very first person is Stuart Copeland talking about Sting. I just want to, I'm going to say this before and after the clip. He was in the police at the time when he said this about his bandmate. The best way to get Sting foaming at the mouth is to call his music pop music. I'll remember that. Well, but you just, as you just said, it is important for him to have hit songs. And so it's a it's the perfect one. It works every time. He needs that acceptance. So um, all of his songs are like... He doesn't need acceptance from anybody. He has enough faith in his material. And with talent like that, it's hardly surprising. Um, he, he, if he, if his songs weren't hit songs, he would just think it's because the world is crazy. Um, anybody who doesn't like his music has got a problem. And that's that's you know, when you've got talent like that, I suppose you can have that kind of arrogance too. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. It, you get the impression that Copeland loves to wind Sting up, right? Absolutely. He's just kind of in the background, yeah. like throwing out little darts, and Sting yeah. just loses his mind. Yeah. And you can see, like, 
I was a huge Police fan. Right? Me too. Still all, am. All five albums. I loved them. Mm-hmm. And when, you know, Synchronicity came out, I went, yeah, this is their Sgt. Pepper. This is great. I loved it. But you can also see how Sting didn't want to have to countenance anybody else's right. opinion on his music. Right. Right. You know, they're getting into fist fights. Mm-hmm. And so, and this was around the time of Synchronicity, this interview. I haven't perfectly date stamped it but i think it was around the time when he did the soundtrack for rumblefish uh stuart copeland but it's still shocking to me that he can badmouth his bandmate like this but i guess that's what they were like i I think that's what they were like yeah they they were they fought a lot and to your point fist fights yeah in the studio yeah and i'd heard stories like synchronicity uh when they were recording that i did a show on that i believe and uh the stuff that went on in the studio was just ridiculous yeah so i think they recorded that down in jamaica like it was somewhere hot and then they brought it to Montserrat to uh master it i believe it was the end right during that period like they were done with each other yeah yeah uh, there's a i've seen a good interview with uh with stuart recently just talking about some some of the police songs and uh and just his parts like sometimes he was given like one pass through the song mm. to listen to it and then he had to provide the beat and his his beats were like not redone, whereas Sting and Andy could redo their guitars and their vocals and all that and their bass uh, uh, guitar uh, multiple times. But Stewart only had like one pass through the song. Really? And so he had to be happy with almost like one take on each song. It was It's a weird kind oh, wow. of description of it, but apparently that's the way it worked. I saw an interview with him once saying that Sting just wanted him to play like a like a standard 4-4 four, four beat, right? But he would never do that. He would Wrong always say, guy. He's, he's like, you know, Sting would just yell saying, just give me something standard. Yes. You know? <laughs> but he wouldn't. But, but, you know, that's at Stuart Copeland. Like, think about Walking on the Moon. You know, I know the song is tired now because it gets played all the time and all that. Mm. But listen to the drumming on that oh, or God. anything on Regatta de Blanc and... Uh, yeah. And uh, Zenyatta Mandata and all the all all those albums, yeah. Like he was so creative, and that's one of the things that made the police great. I completely agree with you. Mm-hmm. I, I I would go as far as to say he's one of the greatest drummers, yes, in the history of rock. Really. Yeah, he's that good. He's crisp. He's fast. He's tight. He's precise. Yeah. He he's and and he's imaginative. You know. So when you listen to Especially synchronicity, just because like Hugh Padgham and, and that production yeah. is so crisp yeah. and clean. You can hear all the little, like the high end stuff. You know, I, I've said on the show before that I used to bring syn- synchronicity in when I bought stereo gear because I wanted to, to hear how it sounded through that. Yeah. Because it was that good. Like the production of those records is amazing. And it's perfect for a guy like Copeland because he's so precise. And he had like all those drums, yeah, you know, and like all the percussive instruments. Like he was so interesting to listen to. Absolutely. Yeah. But he was almost like playing on the edge of uh, like he was almost like skittering over the beat sometimes because he was going so fast. But I think part of that is because he's only heard the song once and now he's expected (laughs) to to play it. I didn't know that. Amazing. I met him briefly. I got his uh, I got his autograph on my copy of Synchronicity and I walked into the room and looked at him and I Oh, there's the guy that made me quit playing drums, I said to him. <laughs> and he wasn't like, you know, he kind of like, yeah, who's this guy? But he was fine. He yeah, was yeah. fine. It just, you know, he wasn't as uh, enamored with my remark as I was. <laughs> oh, really? That's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, he always he always has fans coming up to him. He probably heard that like yeah. every day, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this next one is Miles Goodwin right. against the city of Toronto. Right. So this is probably in the 80s, and uh, April Wines had a lot of success. But for some reason, the Toronto critics, particularly I think the Toronto Star critics, particularly Peter Goddard of the Toronto Star, oh, okay. were particularly pissy towards April Wine. Hmm. Right? And I don't know what it was. It was kind of snobbery. And so, so when he's talking about Toronto here... I think Miles Goodwin is really talking about Toronto critics. And I spoke to Miles Goodwin just a, just a few years ago, probably 18 months before he passed away. Oh. And to talk to him about critics mm-hmm. and even about this clip. Okay. And he, he specifically pointed out like Toronto star rock critic Peter Goddard kind of thing. Oh. Right? And it was, so that was kind of a when rock stars attack too. But this is just a general hit. Miles Goodwin versus the city of Toronto. Just blanket statement. All right, here it is. 
Toronto, there's a love-hate relationship with Toronto and April Wine. I mean, I know that. It's always been there, you know, from the early days when we played the high schools and the clubs. And Why is that? I don't know why. I don't know why. We've, you see, we've never really if indeed it's wined true. and dined the people of Toronto, and I think that's a big part of it. Um, and people uh, hold things against us, which is, doesn't make any difference because uh, every album sells, and we did 12,000 here, and life goes on. Okay. It bothers me. I can't say it doesn't bother me. Uh, I, I, I honestly can take criticism. I can take criticism, you know, mm -hmm. but I can't take malicious shots, which Toronto gives to everybody. When can we expect to see Miles Goodwin and April Wine back in Toronto? We're never, I... we're never going to play here again. Never? Never. Unless maybe this summer. <laughs> <laughs> if they want us. Isn't that who, funny? Who was that? Who was interviewing him? Uh, John Donaby. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was funny. I love it. When are you coming back? Never. Never again. Unless we come back next summer. <laughs> 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 That's kind of him in a nutshell, right? Kind of bitter. Because yeah. if you'd ever ever heard any interviews with Miles, he's got a bit of an he, or he had a bit of an edge to himself, but he also had a great sense of humor. Okay, and so you can see that in that clip. I had been circling him for a little while just because of all the other people who had been on the show, and people would kind of say, "Just be careful," because he's a he's tough, you know. And in the history of the show, Tom, I think I've done two hundred and almost seventy five episodes now. I've never had a problem with right. anyone in terms of someone having a bad attitude. And so I thought, wow, really? I'm surprised. Yeah. I never did get to him, though. I kind of was closing in on him, and I thought maybe I should just reach out, and, and unfortunately it was too late. But. Yeah. Yeah, he did uh, He did a song. Remember when all the stories about the missing indigenous kids came, yeah. came up? He did a song called Some of Our Children, They Never Grow Up. And it's mm. about that. Okay. Because his his wife, now his widow, is, is an indigenous woman. Okay. Or has indigenous roots. So he had something to promote. So I had him on uh, Famous Lost Words. And, you know, even though we've played lots of April Wine over the years, including him talking about that famous show at the Elma Combo with the Stones and mm -hmm. all that stuff. So we have great content from him. But we talked to him or I talked to him and and, uh, and he was great. But I said to him, you know, you always had this kind of love-hate with the city of Toronto. He goes, oh, you think? Like, <laughs> right away. Right away. And so it was pretty It was pretty funny. It was still there all those years later. Right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So up next, okay, this is a pretty odd one. So this is Jan Arden okay. versus Jewel. Now, Jan oh. Arden visited our morning show many, many times. Okay. And always funny. Laugh out loud, hysterically funny. Yeah. And of course her songs are often like like so sad. You know, yeah. I would die for you insensitive. and insensitive and all those. But we did a broadcast with her and this that's from this. So this is Roger Ashby, Marilyn Dennis, and Jan Arden. And it's actually on location. I'm producing this show, but I'm back in the studio. And they're down, I think, at the old Bravo rehearsal hall, I think is what they called it. We would do some broadcast from there. And for some reason, she just somebody brings up Jewel. Because oh, we were giving away tickets for Jewel. And Marilyn starts by saying, like, have you met Jewel? So let's have a listen. Have you met Jewel? Had a little bit of a fight with her not three weeks ago. <laughs> You're not talking to her still, huh? Well, what had happened, of course, is I ran into her in a little studio in New York City. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> and she was there with her little dog. And, of course, the band and I had been out all night, uh, you know, just doing kind of a Congo thing. Yeah. And, of course, we all had pork chops with us, <laughs> which was a bit of a problem with Jewel's dog. Right. Yeah, and what we learned is never, never have a pork chop with you around a little dog and a pop singer. Yeah. Okay. So I feel alert. a song coming on. Yeah, Lesson there was alert. an incident. Jewel has changed somehow. Am I the only one that has noticed no, this? No, we had a lot of posing, a lot of, lot of, a uh, lot of boob. I find. <laughs> like I. Well, she's dating a rodeo guy, so what can I say? She's still with that little tiny rodeo fellow, is yes, she? Yes. Yes. Hmm. Good for you her. Sell CDs. Yeah. Did well, no, I just, I just, I just saw the video and the fire hose and stuff, and as soon as I saw it, I thought, <laughs> "Damn, another one of my ideas shot to hell." <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Jan is that's a that's a weird one. So Jan off the off the top is she's just riffing like she's a comedian just doing her thing. Yeah, she yeah. probably has never met Jewel. That's my guess. Oh, really? Right? Like I don't think that was a the, the pork chop thing. She was just riffing. She was just being silly. That's comedian Jan. But then. She's critiquing her on Jewel's new image, which was a thing at the time. Because Jewel comes out of Alaska and, you know, from living in a van 
to becoming this multi-platinum selling artist mm -hmm. who kind of has like an organic vibe. And then all of a sudden she's doing a song called Intuition, which is almost like a slinky Shakira, Britney type sound. And mm. everybody's going like, what's going on here? So that's what she was referring to. So, so even though that was an odd confluence of thoughts that were coming from Jan, which is what she's like sometimes on stage, the ending was pretty pointed about kind of Jewel's transformation. Now, I haven't really kept up with Jewel over the last many years. I don't know how, how she's landed lately. Mm. Um, I interviewed her once, by the way. Maybe the worst interview I ever did. Oh, Because no. I read this great article from Rolling Stone, and I thought I knew all about her. And so I'd go in there and say, you know, I know you like this. And she goes, I don't know where you got that idea. I don't, you know. Oh, really? And so yo, it was awful. It was awful. But it was my fault oh, for no. assuming that I knew the artist instead of going in there with curiosity instead of confidence. I should have gone in there more with, with curiosity. It was very early in my interviewing career, but it really set me on my ass. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Was she rude? Uh, I would think so. Yeah. I think she had, uh, I think she was in the eye of the storm at that time. Okay. Right. At the peak of the insane, the insane amount of uh, attention she was getting and the stardom. Mm -hmm. And it was at a planet, it was at the planet Hollywood right beside the dome. Oh, downtown wow. Toronto. Okay. And I met her, at, we sat down at a table and I recorded it. And by the time I left, I was just, I was so shaken because it was terrible. Oh, and I was no. so, I was a fan and I thought I understood her message. And I thought, I don't know if I know where the interview is. Like I can't find it, but yeah. I'm not sure I'd listen to it anyway. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. I? Wow. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever had a bad interview or a bad situation where you just can't, you, you can't face it again. No, I, I was thinking, you know, no, I, and I'm not, I'm, I'm just thinking about times. I had one show where it wasn't bad. The person was just not suited to do an interview. Right. Because this person was very young I see. and their parents brought them in. This was a PR guy set this up and she was on the show. I never did air it because it lasted for like, like 13 minutes and her parents brought her down to the spoke club where I used to record the show. Yeah. And I had the, you know, I was prepared. I'd done my bit. Very young pop singer, right? Local. Yeah. And she was supposed to be the next big thing. That's that's how she was touted. And so I, you know, had my questions prepared and I asked her and she had her songs and everything. But she literally gave like maybe five word answers. Right. Or she would say things like, oh, me and my friends like to jump on the bed to the song. And that's it. Like oh, it would stop boy. there. And I just thought, I can't, like, I can't use this. No. It was done. And her parents were really like, okay, well, let her do that over again. And oh. It, yeah, it was a nightmare, Tom. It right. was really bad. I never did. <laughs> I still have it. It's like on the shelf. I can't oh use it. Oh, my God. It's really, it was terrible. So yeah. that was the only time when it was kind of weird. Um, there was one other situation where somebody, you know, wasn't the best. Right. Um, popular Canadian band, but. Yeah, uh, I think maybe you've told me yeah, a little I, bit of behind I, the scenes on this. Yes. Yeah, I did tell you, but but that was the only time really. Everybody else, I've had. I will tell you that I've had some great experiences. Yeah, two jump to mind right away, and I love telling these these stories. Julian Taylor used to be in a band called Staggered Crossing. Okay, he brought his guitar in, and Julian Taylor right now is like he's killing it. Right, he's got great records, and he's kind of more of an R and B like the, you know. Later on, he was, but the Stegger Crossing was hard rock. Mm -hmm. Came out late nineties. I loved it. I didn't know who Julian Taylor was. He was the singer in this band. So I found that out after he was promoting like his later stuff. This was years and years later, and I said, "Hey, Stegger Crossing, I love that band." He's like, "Oh wow, I haven't, I haven't thought about that for so long." Right? Yeah. He's got his guitar. We're ready to go into recording. And I just thought, you know what? I'm going to ask him. I'm going to just, would you play something like that? And he goes, do you want me to play like, uh, you know, Further Again, which was my favorite song? Yeah. And I said, you don't have to, dude. That was like 20 years ago. And yeah. Like, no, no, no. Come on. We'll try it. And he didn't, he couldn't remember it. But he like, as we were recording, he was piecing it together. Oh, don't you love that? And then he looked up and he's like, I got it. And I'm like, dude, I can't believe you're doing this for my benefit. <laughs> and he's like, no, it's cool. And he played the song on right. acoustic. Wow. I thought that was the greatest thing. Like that just I, yeah. like props to him. I I love that guy. Barney Bentall was another one. Yeah. You know, he had his guitar. He had, he hadn't planned on playing. He was on his way to a show at Hughes room and he just had it with him. And I said, Oh, you brought your guitar. He's like, yeah, I just, and, and I said, do you want to play? And he's like, I wasn't expecting to. And I said, don't worry about it then. Yeah. And he goes, no, he goes, what do you want to hear? And I said, are you kidding? And wow. he goes, no, 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 man, I'll play anything you want. Yeah. Barney Bentall. Yeah. And I said, how about something to live for? Yeah. He goes, you got it. Good and song. He, and he knocked it out. And I like, it was just, I felt like it was for me. And yeah. oh, 
I know yeah, that's talk great. about skin it vibration. Is, it is great when they. Uh, so what would happen on the on the Chum FM morning show is we'd sometimes have artists in, and for the most part, they don't want to perform at seven forty five in the morning. They no. just don't, right? No. And but every once in a while, they'd come in, and so you know, um, Colby Colby Calais. Yes. So she's the daughter of Ken Calais, who who produced or engineered Rumors and worked with uh, Lindsey Buckingham and uh, and Fleetwood Mac. Mm-hmm. Anyway, she has a hit called Bubbly. Great song, like yeah. a really light, literally a bubbly song. And she comes in and sings it. Well, when she's in there, I guess she needs someone to look at when she's singing. So she's singing it to me. Oh, wow. And I'm going, uh, guys, did you see that? Eye contact for the whole song, right? And they're going, no, no. She was looking at me, right? I'm going, no, no, for sure. And the same thing happened. We did a 90-minute live interview with uh, Dido around the time when she had th- uh, Thank You and White Flag. Great yeah. song, like great pop songs, really thoughtful, good songwriter. And she did the White Flag song and she had no one else to look at, I guess. And she, she was looking at me and it's just, it sends like, like shockwaves through you when they're doing it for you. Right. And, you know, you know they're doing it for the radio audience who's listening, but they need someone to they need connect with. Yeah. And so I was the guy. Good for you. So, yeah. Um, I wanted to tell you one more thing. Funny moment. When you were talking about that one singer, we we had a few singers on the show who were maybe less than good. And one of them was um, <laughs> Ashley Simpson. Oh. So Ashley Simpson had a song called Pieces of You. Pieces. Like really, really oh, bad. Yeah. She was sound, she looked like she was doing a bad Corey Hart imitation. I'm just uh, talking about the mouth. I'm not okay. talking about the music. And so she did this song and it was really rough, right? Okay. We had another, we had the Pussycat dolls in when they oh. were really breaking out the very first time. Okay. And we had all five pussycat dolls in. Wow. And mics for five of them. Yep. And they said, only turn on three of the mics. No. Don't turn on the other two. Don't turn on these two mics. <laughs> no. So they way. did they did don't you? Don't you wish your girlfriend was hot like me that one? Right. right? Yeah, I remember that. And song. it was fine. And, and Nicole Scherzinger was uh who's currently on Broadway by the way killing it but she was there and she sang and she was fine you know for that song she was great right but it's funny give us five mics you only have to plug in three of them <laughs> wow two of the dolls didn't yeah. sing then yeah. did they ever sing i don't know that's very interesting i don't know it was funny are you going to divulge after the show who the dolls were which dolls <laughs> oh i don't remember right there was one of the girls who kind of thought it was her band. She was like a Vegas performer, but I don't remember if she was one with the with the mic plugged in or or not. You know? I don't wow. remember. I don't. <laughs> that is so crazy. Yeah. I love that story. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Uh okay. See, this is what happens when you and I talk. I know we just go left forever. turn, buddy. No, I took a sorry, left turn in Albuquerque there. No, that's okay. That's great. All right, next clip. Okay, so the next clip, over the years when we done when rock stars attack. I would say at least 40 to 50% of them are when rock stars attack critics, yep. right? We have Carly Simon being attacked by a critic, okay? Robert Criscow, very, very famous. Oh, yeah, uh, New York, Stone. I think New York Times, New York, no, not New York Times, LA, LA Times reporter, something like that, no, right? No, he, he, he wrote for everybody. Like, he wrote for Village Boys. Right, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Maybe, yeah. yeah. So he reviews the album with Your Sylvain on it. Mm-hmm. And says, Carly Simon sounds like a horse whinnying on oh, your Sylvain. That's nasty. Yeah. And so she writes him a letter. Mm-hmm. And we have this clip. So she's kind of doing the backlash against Robert Crisco. She actually writes him a letter saying, you know, it's a, it's a human being you're talking about here. Mm-hmm. Right. So we've got instances where artists are lashing out at critics or are reacting to the way critics have treated them. This one is funny. It's really short. It's Jim Kerr from Simple Minds. Yeah. And he has this line about critics, and you know he has said this a thousand times, but he nails it, and it's like eight seconds long, right? It, it's the best metaphor ever. Right. Yeah. Get All right. It. Here it is. I was thinking the other day as well how to describe critics. With all respect to them, and there are some that I like, I think critics are a bit like voyeurs in a bordello or a, or a brothel. <laughs> they, see it every, they see it every day. They've saw it all before. But they never join in, and I don't know if they could do it themselves. <laughs> That's Jim Kerr of Simple Minds. I love that. In conversation with my buddy Gore James in about 1982, around the time of New Gold Dream. That's a great album, by the way. If you're a new wave kid, 
New Gold Dreams, Sparkle in the Rain, Sons in Fascination, that whole, they had some albums come out around that time, Simple Minds, that were outstanding. Their drummer used to play in a metal band. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. There was a guy, I think it's the guy, um, I think it's Mel Gaynor you're talking yeah. about. He could hit those freaking drums oh, yeah. hard. Yeah. And what happened is when when Simple Minds first came out, they were very synthy and it was fine. Mm-hmm. But when they added drums, it got way better. And then by the mid 80s, when they were doing like, Don't You Forget About Me and other songs around that time, that guy was hitting those drums and it made it way more rock. Oh, yeah. And less less kind of electro pop. Yeah. Like I like their electro pop sound, but man, when that when he, you know, and on stage, I saw them a couple of times and they were good and he was exceptionally good. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 I used to watch him in videos and I didn't know that at the time. And I thought like, wow, he's a, he looks like he's a very skilled Yeah, he's hitting those player. damn things. Yeah. But then I found out that he used to play in like, and it wasn't just a metal band. I think it was like a thrash band. Oh, like It was okay. heavy, heavy. Yeah. yeah. Huh. I can't remember the name, but anyway. Yeah. So that's just an ex- example, you know, <laughs> in so many of our uh, When Rock Stars Attack features, you know, we've had a whole bunch of them taking on critics. We've had the Bee Gees, Paul Stanley of Kiss. Oh. And that was an interview that I did with him in 99 when he was in Toronto. Oh, for Phantom. For Phantom. Yeah. So that's a whole episode, right? Of me talking to him. And that was fun. And I said, one of the things I said to him is like, Paul, do you think that, you know, this is really good for you to branch out like this because then the critics will kind of like see you in a different light and kind of give you more leeway, the benefit of the doubt or whatever. And he said, you know, the critics are so unimportant in the history of music. They only want to tell you what to listen to. Because they think they know better than you, but they're they're all just frustrated. But he does it in a very. I'm sure you've heard. Oh yeah, you've heard him in it. He's kind of he's kind of nice about it, right? He's not an ass about it, like mm-hmm. like Simmons would be. Yeah. But but he just said, you know, they're unimportant, and nobody really cares about them. But he says it in a way that's kind of like pleasant. Right? <laughs> yeah. How was he in the interview? Is he a good guy? He was great. Good. He was great. And Good. at one point I was kind of fanboying out. I'm saying, you know, I think maybe the thing about you guys is all four of you are good at what you do. You're, you're like virtuosos at what you do and it comes together and it's great. And he goes, well, really nobody would call us, any of us virtuos- <laughs> virtuosos. None of us are going to win any reader's poll about things. But he didn't say it. He didn't say it to be nasty to me. He just said, but what we do is, you know, we work hard and we give people what, what they want and, and all that. But they did. Like I was talking about, I was talking about the song 100,000 Years from nice. the live album. Yeah. And everybody is freaking great on that song. Oh, yeah. The way he leads the crowd, right. in, you know, if you all believe in rock and roll, then why don't you stand up for what you believe in? And then the whole thing, and then the drum solo, and then Ace on the lead guitar, and, and Gene just rocking that cool bass line. Right? That was insane. And so I was kind of using that as a, as a template of how good they were. Mm. And, you know, he appreciated my compliments and all that, but he said, no, we're not, we're not virtual. So we're just, we're kind of good at what we do and we do it well together. Good for him. Yeah. Nobody can ever take that away from Kiss. You know, we, yeah. we say what we do about Kiss, but nobody can take away the fact that those guys worked hard. Yeah. They put in their 10,000 hours. Yeah. Good I'm, on them. I'm currently listening to the, uh, Getty Lee autobiography, My F in Life. Oh, really? And I, I'm listening to you know him reading the book, right? <laughs> yeah. It's great. It's great. Um, and one of the things he talks about, it's really surprising, is that they work with Kiss a lot. Yeah, for sure. And they opened for Kiss. And one of the things he said about Kiss is they were really generous with giving them a sound check. Mm. And uh, so many other bands were not. Mm. They were real asses about it. Yeah. And so... He, he really appreciates that. And they also had a great time partying. And But there was one point where he, there was something that happened with uh, Gene and a, and a groupie and all that stuff. And, and Getty was not, not impressed at all. That's the most recent time he's talked about it in the book. Um, I'm about probably a third of the way in. And I had a bad, ex- we had a bad experience with Gene on our morning show. I'm not surprised by yeah. that. Sadly. He was just so gross. He was so disgusting. And on the air, but he was talking about, he was, pawning off an energy drink for Frank Stronach, of all people, oh, right? Ooh. Frank's energy drink is what it was called. And he was talking about the way you drink the thing and he was being so disgusting about it. Yeah. And so disrespectful. And there were models in with him to, uh, you know, to promote the drinks as well. And, you know, we said, oh, you know, what's the name of, what's the name of the, uh, the women that are with you today? And he goes, does it matter? 
like just gross. And then he oh. posed for pictures. The way he was grabbing women in the pictures to get them to move closer to him was disgusting. I wanted to punch the guy. Oh, really? I am a little guy. He's a very not little guy. Yeah. And I wanted to sock that mother. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, he, he's turned a lot of people off. He was just recently on, uh, uh, well, Erica M was on the show and she did not have nice things yes. to say about Gene Simmons. Yeah. Um, Lori Brown too. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. He was on Dancing with the Stars yeah. recently and people were calling him creepy. Oh, which is okay. The, probably the worst thing that someone can say about yes. you, right? As a yeah. male. Creepy. Yeah. Yeah. Not good. No. <laughs> Sorry. Where were we? Where oh were we? God, what day was, is it? That was Jim Kerr of Simple Minds. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Right. That's funny. We have one more clip. Time. All right. This one is the most famous of the bunch. So this is not from the Chum or Chum FM interview archives. This is from the Much Music archives. But it stars my co-host, Christopher Ward. So Christopher is told just a few hours ahead of time, maybe a, maybe a day, that George Harrison was going to be dropping by the much environment, and he was going to be doing this interview. But there was no promotion for it. And the reason why there's no promotion for it, this is 1989. Mm -hmm. George doesn't want people to know where he's going to be before he's there. Can you imagine why? Because of of Lennon getting shot. Oh, is that why? Yeah. See, that's interesting because he, someone broke into his home, if you remember. Well, yeah, but that that was years later. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But yes, that's right. And so Harrison shows up and there's maybe no bigger uh, Beatles fan than Christopher Ward. Mm. So he interviews them. And then this little moment happens where Christopher's talking about Paul McCartney wanting to redo some Beatles songs, which he did for the movie, the soundtrack of the ill-fated movie, an ill-fated soundtrack, Give My Regards to Broad Street. (laughs) Horrible. (laughs) Horrible. Anyway, uh, his third worst, uh, McCartney's third worst decision after Maxwell Silverhammer and oh. The Girl Is Mine with Michael Jackson. Interesting. Uh, but anyway, so let's have a listen to this. Would you ever go back and re-record any of those songs? Uh, if I Needed Someone or Tax Man or something like that? I don't know. It's, it's easier to write a new one, yeah. really. How did you feel when you heard the McCartney versions of the old songs on uh, Broad Street? I think they were okay. I didn't notice that they were new versions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't. I only watched it once. I quite liked it, but I don't, I don't really. I remember dancing all that one about ballroom dancing and stuff. I don't remember the old ones. He said that he wanted to tackle some of the other old songs, including possibly some of John Lennon's songs, like uh, "Beautiful Boy" and "Imagine." Does that surprise you that he would do that? Paul. Yeah. Maybe because he ran out of good ones of his own. <laughs> <laughs> well. Now we've got that on record. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. That is devastating. Yeah. So George Harrison says maybe Paul McCartney has run out of good ideas for songs. And did you hear the people? There was a lot of laughter. There was a lot that. of laughter because yeah. that's the much environs, right? And so people are crowded around mm-hmm. and listening and people laugh. And then Harrison says that's it's true. And that has been viewed on YouTube more than 2.6 million times. Like I'm a I'm a big Paul guy. Me too. Right. I've read books about Paul. I've read books about John, and I recently read the uh, Philip Norman book about George. Mm-hmm. And I love George. And you know, he was a miserable guy very often. Yeah. And he had a lot of bitterness, and some of that bitterness was misplaced, and some of that bitterness was well placed, in my opinion, because he wasn't treated with respect by Lennon and McCartney. When you're in a band with men- Lennon and McCartney, it's possible you're not going to be you know, featured on the top rung, right? even though something from Abbey Road and Here Comes the Sun from Abbey Road and Taxman are examples of why he probably should have been accorded a little more respect, you yeah, know? I, I think so. I think about that often. I have a lot to say about that. But what I will say is that I think that being in a band, first of all, with McCartney and Lennon is not an easy gig. No. Okay. So there's that. If he were outside that band and he showed up with, you know, Here Comes the Sun yeah. and something he would be, you know, the Paul McCartney of his band. That's right. Because those are, those are A-list songs. So he had a bit of a tough go, right. you know, from, I would say, I don't know, like Rubber Soul and Revolver all the way through. Because he was really, I had heard that he would put these songs forward and they would say, sorry, 
It's like that guest on Johnny Carson. Oh, we ran out of time. Yes. Can you come back? Right? Yeah. It's always like next time, next time, next time. Yeah. So tough. But at the same time, he was particularly acerbic with his comments. And he, yeah. he was nasty. And yes. I, I don't know if he could back them up. Like something like that. I don't know if you can say that about Paul McCartney. No. Do you know no. what I mean? No, you can't. Not fairly. No. Like you right. could take a take a swing at him and make people laugh and all that. But yeah. he's being a bitter, bitter old guy there. Right. Then, now, now, this is at the time when he's promoting his Cloud Nine album, which was a big comeback for him. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So he's kind of on the top of the world. And I think that. Post Beatles, so once they record, you know, let it the Let It Be album and then the Abbey Road album, even though they release them in a different order. Once he's free, you know, he has all these songs and he right. puts out a triple album. Yes, you know, perhaps one of the greatest triple albums, one of the few triple albums, one of the greatest <laughs> triple albums ever released by a major artist. And it's you know, there's some great like that is a great album. I think he should have done three single albums instead. Yeah, right, because I think he kind of shot his shot at that point and some of his stuff in the following years weren't nearly as good as you know my sweet lord and isn't it a pity and all those right songs. right uh yeah but that is a historically famous moment in when rock stars attack history on that topic just really quickly yeah. so when they were winding down with abbey road there were a lot of songs that were being rehearsed during that time that we would hear much later right that could have ended up on abbey road Jealous Guy was right. one of them. Great and, song. God, and, I love that song. Yeah, right? And My Sweet Lord was another one. Like imagine, I've had this conversation. We, we've done a few Beatles specials on on Famous Lost Words. And I posited the question, what would those great songs by the solo Beatles have sounded like as Beatles songs, right? I think My Sweet Lord would have sounded pretty similar. I think Band on the Run would have sounded not quite as polished, but it would mm-hmm. have been great Mm -hmm. like great you know all of those songs and you know jealous guy even instant karma like instant karma as a beatles song jesus would have been amazing you can hear the demos for jealous guy yeah it's called child of nature okay and if you listen to the white album special deluxe edition it's on there wow and it's pretty interesting yeah yeah that's awesome yeah really cool so there you go buddy thank you can wow. I, can I give a, can I just let people know that if you're interested in what, listening to the show, we've got specials on New Wave, One Hit Wonders, 90s, Motown, R&B and Soul and more and if you're a hard rock fan, we've got interviews with Ozzy Osbourne from his early solo days, okay? Uh Bruce Dickinson of Iron Maiden talking about how he got that uh the nickname. What's the what's his nickname? The, the Human Air Raid Siren. The Air Raid Siren. He talks about that moment when he was named that. It's so funny. And we're talking about in the moment. We're talking early 80s interview with Bruce Dickinson. Oh, right? I want to hear and that. The, and the, uh, uh, we've got Motorhead. Got an interview with Lemmy and Filthy Phil. It's so <laughs> funny. And so and God, talk about likable. Oh, my God. Lemmy's oh, he's freaking fantastic. great. Yeah, and they talk great. about um, their first time in Toronto. This is like the night before a gig. They're, they walk into a bar and the band on stage is doing a Motorhead song. And they're like stunned because they weren't really big but the the band on stage had heard them and was like rocking out with one of their songs and they were just like they were honored to be in toronto for that band you know and we got a ton of rush content tons Mm. yeah we did a we did an episode where we did album by album from their first major album to subdivisions and we've got getty commenting on every single one of those oh that's cool and what it is is it's not getty doing a doing a retrospective it's getty from the mid 70s talking about 2112 mm. and then getty from 1979 80 talking about moving pictures so it's not him looking back it's him in the moment talking about the new album so it's that kind of thing that we do i want to come and work on your show <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna send you i'm gonna send you some audio unlabeled which is sometimes how i get the how I have the clips. Oh, so it's a surprise. And you just have to go, who is this? Oh, this is Tommy Two-Tone talking about this hit song, 8675309 Jenny. Wow. <laughs> or this is maybe the band Pilot who had the, ma- you know, oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, it's, it's mad. magic. Yeah. yeah. It, it, you know, you're kind of going, I think that's them. 
But anyway, so one of these days I'll dig up some of those. But you know, okay. Well, I want to be in on this, so get them and we'll okay. bring them here and we'll listen to them together. <laughs> we'll be looking at each other, going, "Who the hell is this Who guy?" Is that? Yeah, yeah. There you go, Brad. <laughs> okay, man. Listen, thanks so much for coming. Of course, we appreciate it. It's always great to have you. Yeah. All yeah. right. Thanks. All right. All right, this has been No Sleep Till Sudbury with Brent Jensen and my very special guest, Mr. Tom Jokic. Until next time, folks, take good care. Brent Jensen is the best-selling author of No Sleep Till Sudbury, Leftover People, and All My Favorite People Are Broken. All titles available in stores and on Amazon Worldwide.